Hi, I'm Keith Stroyan. Uh, I'm a math professor at the University of Iowa. I'm going to talk tomorrow about uh, a new book that's available from the Wolfram store called Advanced Calculus Using Mathematica. It's all written in Mathematica notebooks, and we've been using variations on it for many years in engineering math. Over the last 15 years, I've taught around 6,000 engineering students <laughs> this material and use these, the materials I'm going to talk about in various formats. This, this current one, we fi I finally published as uh, an e-book, I guess you call it, in Mathematica notebooks, and that's specifically what I'll talk about. Uh, calculus uh, really is a subject that's worth uh, the engineering student's time to study. It's a basis of a lot of their engineering courses, and it really has served as a language of change for the last 300 years. But it's still important, and uh, uh, I can give you a particular example. A few years ago, I was duck hunting in North Dakota with a friend of mine, and there weren't any ducks. So we got talking about his research on human visual depth perception. And the result of that was a little bit of calculus and a little bit of vision science, and we solved an important problem that, had appear, that appeared in Nature in 2008 about how people perceive depth from motion. So calculus is alive and well, and well worth the student's time. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, OK, so the book I'm going to tell you about, uh, I want to tell you about how it's organized, and specifically with a goal of trying to make the subject more accessible to students. Uh, Mathematica plays a role in that at kind of two levels. One, uh, it can help students understand the concepts. And really, having good conceptual understanding, not necessarily pedantic rigor, epsilons and deltas, but a good idea of what the gradient measures and things like that is really important uh, for engineers who are going to use the subject. But uh, OK, I thought of uh, really a dual audience for today's talk because uh, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how uh, we distribute this stuff. Uh, it's uh, reasonably important that you're able to get the stuff out without giving it all away, I guess. <clears throat> uh, over the years, and while I developed this, I used to sell versions of this on a CD at a local bookstore, and students would steal it with impunity. I sold it for five bucks. I mean, that's what the store charged. The theft didn't bother me, but what really annoyed me was when they came to my office to have me fix the stolen copy that didn't work, because <laughs> they didn't know how to. So we've worked out a, a, a pretty good system uh, 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 at Wolfram to distribute this stuff. OK, so back to kind of how the uh, uh, book works and how Mathematica helps, hopefully helps engineers both learn the subject and expand their, uh, the power of the things that they can use, the, use calculus for. OK, so let's go on to the, So this is kind of an outline, give you an idea what the contents are. Uh, what the organization is, <clears throat> some of the organizational themes, uh, and kind of you know how we how I organize the material, <clears throat> and a little bit of uh, uh, stuff that Mathematica is making possible that's kind of fallen out of uh, traditional calculus books. Uh, we we teach this course. I teach the course in sort of two levels. This is the table of contents. Uh, this is a, you know, the, the Wolfram thing. This is the actual, I guess I won't enlarge this. This is an, ac the, an actual page from the book with uh, all these links. And the picture has to do with divergence theorem and, and curl. And all these things are sort of hot linked uh, into the actual text. OK, the table of contents is, looks pretty ordinary except for uh, some of the advanced topics that have kind of been lost, and I'll mention a few, some things. OK. So uh, what are the mathematical things? How did I organize it? So this is 
the part of the talk for people that might be interested in actually using this to teach uh, multivariable calculus. Uh, vector calculus can be a hard subject for students to learn, if, especially if they approach it fr from the point of view of, well, memorize a formula for this case, memorize a formula for that case. Let me give you an example. The gradient's perpendicular to the graph, right? Well, in some cases, yes, in other cases, no. So the equation of the tangent sort of, there's sort of all these different versions of the equation for the tangent, and why they all involve partial derivatives of some sort, why is that? Well, there's a way to organize the material so that there's one way to calculate the tangent, but it involves thinking about how you represent graphs. So this is kind of an organizational theme for the whole course. Graphs are organized as explicit, implicit, or parametric graphs. And if you do that, then there's really only one way to calculate the tangent. And it's compatible with the main idea of differential calculus that smooth things under a microscope look linear. And uh, so that's kind of the idea. And let's see, uh, I want to do that next. What I've done for this talk, because you, you can access, access this later, uh, is I put two kinds of links in here. Uh, one directly to the web. So this is, this is a web page, and it goes through these different kind of things. So if you uh, organize uh, calculus this way, implicit, explicit, and parametric graphs, then there's really one procedure for finding tangents, but it has various implementations. Z equals f of x and y, and this is uh, the procedure in that case as a web page. It's always three steps. Calculate the total differential, specify the point of tangency, and interpret the graph in either local or global coordinates. Uh, so this is uh, the explicit case. Uh, uh, this is the implicit case in two dimensions. And you should just sort of ignore the fact that the print's small and observe that it looks like the same procedure in every case. And it is, except that uh, this procedure results in a linear equation of the same type. And so the next step is to understand the linear algebra for the different cases of explicit, implicit, and parametric graphs. Okay, so that's, that's a theme to try to help the students uh, learn the subject. Now let's see here what kind of a... Uh, okay, I, I've also put links directly to the text for the talk because I wasn't sure I'd have internet connectivity uh, today. So, uh, uh, one way Mathematica helps a lot, and uh, Eric is here, he's done a lot of really nice stuff on the web. One way it helps is it just gives people a sort of a dynamic or interactive uh, uh, kinds of graphics. Here's, here's one particular example. <clears throat> Uh, in, cal in calculus of several variables, it's important to be able to deal with either um, uh, explicit or, or implicit graphs. And contour graphs are a little bit hard to understand. Uh, if you've ever hiked with a topo map, uh, I'm only alive because I didn't do it in the fog. Uh, when I got to a place uh, that looked kind of steep, I got the map out and noticed that the lines were close together. Uh, and didn't step off the cliff. Uh, but here's an example of an interactive program. And remember, this first main idea of differential calculus is if you zoom in, it looks linear. And here we can zoom in and see both the explicit graph and the associated contour plot. So let's see if this whole thing works. So this is uh, from the text, and it's, it's zooming in on the explicit graph. And there's lots of controls all over the place. Now those procedures that I told you about, it's really one procedure with uh, th three different kinds of graphs or, and in different dimensions. They're, they're in effect a way to compute what you'd see if you, could, if you had an infinitely powerful microscope. So there's the microscope that goes with it, but there's also the computational procedure for the students. Uh, okay, so one aspect of the uh, you know, the, the book is uh, to have these interactive 
uh, kinds of graphical programs. Uh, actually, I thought I was going to say something else at this time. I hope it comes up later. If it doesn't, I'll remember. Okay. I wanted to show you what the book looks like, because a lot of it looks fairly conventional. But uh, uh, this will come up later. Uh, another theme in this course that we teach, and uh, we revamped the engineering math program about 15 years ago when I started teaching these huge classes, uh, to put multivariable topics sooner in the curriculum. The old-fashioned curriculum essentially was students took Calc 1, Calc 2, the old Thomas course from 1948, and then they took linear algebra and differential equations, and finally they took vector calculus. But in the meantime, they'd studied physics, dynamics, statics, and thermodynamics, and used multivariable calculus in all of those courses. And we decided that's a little silly. We, we should teach the multivariable calculus sooner. And it's worked pretty well with physics. Uh, the students that take this kind of on schedule get a heavy dose of vectors in their second semester. So the whole course is sort of organized in this way. And, uh, one of the th things that I encourage students to do is build a lexicon. Uh, not a lexicon between, say, German and English, but a lexicon between geometry and algebra, and then build on this throughout the course. And uh, uh, one uh, particular uh, example of this, this is an exercise set from the uh, course. And these are all links back into the text to help, rem help them remember what should be in their lexicon. My students are supposed to carry a little notebook that will fit in their pocket or purse or whatever. Uh, and I told them that the math police can stop them on the sidewalk and demand their lexicon. Uh, and the idea is that uh, then they can do this. So this is a kind of a neat problem. If uh, velocity is equal to acceleration cross position, just by basic geometry, you can show that uh, this is motion uh, on a latitude line uh, and uh, at constant speed. And this just involves using the geometric lexicon over and over. So we, we try to carry this theme uh, throughout the course. OK, so. Uh, you know, to professional mathematician, I guess no surprise that vectors play an important role, but uh, we're just sort of systematic about it. The other thing that the course doesn't do everything in the standard order. So for example, most books in multivariable calculus, when they first talk about partial derivatives, talk about the, the vector chain rule and vector product rule. But if you examine the exercises, you find that there are no exercises that can't be done without those rules. That's really bad form. So, because students usually work in, with formulas uh, uh, de described in high school terms, and those can be solved with the Calc 1 rules by just holding one variable at a time constant. So, what's the role of the abstract product rule and chain rule? Are they important? Do we really need them? Later in the course, uh, I, I, okay, I guess I slipped. I said the abstract rules. What's important about those rules is when they're applied in an abstract way. So, for example, <clears throat> Uh, the curvature vector is perpendicular to the tan to the curve. And that's a, a, a consequence, believe it or not, of the dot product rule. And uh, here it is in the text. Whoops, if I can see the mouse, here it is. So uh, there's a theorem, and the way you prove it is you say, uh, a unit tangent has norm one, so the dot product is a constant, differentiate both sides, and you get acceleration uh, dot tangent equals zero, which is perpendicular by the uh, product rule. Uh, now, what's a little upsetting to students at this level is what's important is the general rule, not specific applications with formulas. So. When we review differentiation a little bit in the beginning of the course, when we do partial derivatives, and we use partial derivatives a lot before we get to this particular topic, we try to get them to write the product rule and the chain rule rather than to just say it uh, 
in words. Why? Well, because when they get to this level, writing the product rule for vectors and the chain rule and so forth is, is what's important. OK, conservation of energy comes from the chain rule. Uh, the fact that planets orbit in a plane is the product rule for the cross product. And so the, and these are general rules, not for a given uh, formula. OK, I'm running low on time. Let me switch over to how uh, does computer work? How, how to, what kind of computer work do students do? OK, I wanted to show you, and this is where I, I wanted to show you what the textbook looks like. So this is uh, probably too little. I, let me make this bigger. Uh, so, so this is the way the textbook looks. And of course, uh, drag it open bigger. And th the point of this is it looks pretty much like a conventional textbook. Uh, but of course, uh, pictures like this are hot linked to an interactive program. Uh, uh, so a lot of what students do is you know, read this material and solve problems, solve exercises. So there's, there was uh, uh, a procedure here for finding the tangent point and so forth. But uh, we do do some computation, and uh, a, uh, not really a lot. About once a week, we have a computer uh, exercise. And they kind of vary from basic things where we show them how you uh, uh, implement uh, a computer, how you implement on the computer something they've s solved by hand. So this is sort of get them started programming. So they learn how to calculate the equation of a tangent plane. And then a little later, they learn how to make that uh, into a program that draws a tangent plane, computes it with Mathematica, and draws it. Uh, <clears throat> things like that, we sort of help them through, get them started with uh, basic kind of programming. Uh, by the way, in the course, we felt it was important not that they just see things, but that they actually do some of the computing themselves. We're trying to get them to transition into pro as professional engineers, being able to use Mathematica as a tool. Later on, we, once they've built up some basic programming tools, we ask them a bunch of conceptual kind of problems. And this is an example. It's kind of a dirty trick. Uh, uh, draw a surface and its tangent plane. And that they've had help to do before. They're supposed to use the work they've. And then draw the tangent vector that points uphill as fast as possible. Well, this is kind of a trick to see if they understand concepts about the gradient vector. One of the things that I've found experimentally is most students know the gradient points in the direction of fastest increase, but they don't know the gradient. The norm of the gradient has meaning. And we fuss a lot trying to explain vectors or quantities with both magnitude and direction. Well, this exercise requires them to figure out what's the magnitude do to help solve this problem. So there are problems like this. Again, they're kind of conceptual mathematics. Uh, they're tricks with computing. The other one <coughs> that, uh, uh, let's see here if I've got this. The, the other trick to get students to <coughs> uh, learn a little Mathematica programming, because they fuss that, oh, well, I don't know how to program. Well, I mean, some of it is so obvious that you don't need to learn how to program. You just sort of learn how to get the right curly cues on things. And uh, lots and lots of exercises in the text that are intended to be solved by paper and pencil have solutions that are written in Mathematica code. And if they want to check their answer, they have to at least press Enter. <laughs> and uh, and see if they've uh, done it right. So this is a little bit of incentive to get them using uh, uh, Mathematica as a tool of their own. Uh, OK, let's see here. My time is really running low now. Uh, I wanted to advertise. Uh, uh, OK, so computing work is some basic things to help them start programming, some real simple calculations to check paper and pencil work, and then some conceptual problems where they're supposed to kind of put things together and uh, solve a bigger problem. Uh, and there are a lot of examples, but that was just one of them. Uh, it's kind of hard to summarize uh, 
300 megabytes of text in 25 minutes, in 24 minutes, 23, 22. <laughs> He's got numbers up there. He's showing me in the back. Some of the things that I've put in the book that uh, have fallen out of the curriculum and fallen out of most of the standard textbooks, uh, I call novel topics, but they're often not new, but <clears throat> they're, they're things that were known. So for example, something that's often uh, handled incorrectly in, in uh, calculus is these uh, formulas from uh, thermodynamics, and let me make this bigger. Uh, this expression, partial uh, u with respect to p v held constant. Most, uh, a lot of math books treat that as, well, u is a function of p and v, and when uh, you differentiate with respect to p, the other variable is constant. That's not what this means at all. And you'll find it that, that way in many books. What this means is u is a function of p, v, and t, you want the derivative of how much u changes when p varies. v is held constant, but the equation of state is maintained. pv equals nRT. And so uh, this is a topic that's kind of uh, missing in lots of books and actually incorrect in quite a number. Uh, how much does Mathematica help this? I don't know a lot, but uh, the point is the, different, the constraint differentiation problem gets a little bit technical. Mathematica helps some. And Mathematica also, of course, can give lots of specific examples. Uh, uh, functional dependence or vector, de I don't know if you even know what the functional dependence is, but it's sort of the case of the implicit function theorem when the standard uh, condition is not met. And that's, that plays an important role in problems like, for example, vector potential. A vector potential is, if you have a vector field whose, great, whose divergence is zero, can you find an, another vector field whose curl gives you that original thing? That's mentioned in most of the books, but almost never proved. And there's a simple formula for that, and it's in the book. It's, it's OK. It's only local. So there's a Mathematica computation for it. Oh, I said simple. It's maybe not so simple. It involves you know, three integrals. but uh, and handling them in the right order. So it's the kind of thing that it's nice to be able to use Mathematica, organize the calculation, and do it once and for all. OK, there, there are others like uh, 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 <clears throat> if you have a flow of, a say, a two-dimensional uh, vector field, and you zoom in on a, uh, an equilibrium point, well, the general principle says it should look like the linear thing. And there's a theorem here that says it does, and examples where you can zoom in and look at it. Now, uh, this, for example, is a way to show how to linearize the pendulum. The pendulum's a nonlinear equation, and zooming in on the equilibrium gives you the standard linearized pendulum. So that's in there. OK, uh, enough of that. You can take a look at the website for this, and uh, the website looks a lot like the book because it was produced from Mathematica notebooks, but it's not, it's not has, doesn't have full uh, interactive implementation. Actually, I thought of trying to do the book that way, and I finally decided it's important for engineering students to learn to do, do a little bit of Mathematica. Let me just talk about the last minute or two that I have about uh, how this uh, uh, gets distributed. So this is available from the Wolfram store. If you go to the website, I've got a button that'll send you there. Uh, uh, we sell this for $49. That means the students, we, we have a site license for Mathematica, but if students don't have the site license, the book costs under 100 just barely. Uh, and, uh, and if you're interested in distributing these things and not giving them away, uh, free and then fixing them in your office. <laughs> uh, what we've done uh, is the folks at uh, WRI made a CDF installer. So they down, the students download this collection of 600 and whatever it is notebooks. And uh, then they run a, a little uh, a CDF program. And from the cloud, uh, the uh, uh, 
CDF program authenticates that they're the purchaser and installs style sheets uh, and, and utilities packages in uh, hidden directories in their program. And the sign on the back says stop. So I won't tell you more about the details, but basically uh, that's a way to sell the book to a single user and not put it on the web.